Chapter twenty three of Claude Lightfoot, or How the Problem Was Solved by Father Francis Finn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty three The New Tarsicius. When Claude left Willie in the hands of the kindly but unintelligible German woman, he made bravely on to the village. After an hour's walk, it occurred to him that he had misunderstood her attempts at information. It was now drawing near the close of day, and even Claude began to feel anxious and annoyed. If the village which the woman had spoken of were a reality, it ought to be near. Claude gazed about him in quest of some point for observation. The fields on either side were quite flat. To his right rose a thick hedge, which lost itself in the distance to his left the meadows were shut off from the road and divided from each other by the common rail fence a few hundred yards before him and just outside the hedge towered a magnificent oak tree this tree afforded claude the coin of vantage which he desired mounting it with the skill of long practice he straddled a branch about thirty feet above the ground and with his eyes swept the unexplored country beyond the woman had not deceived him a mile or so distant loomed the tapering spire of a church and further down the road passed through the very heart of a small village upon whose roofs the sun was casting his parting beams the prospect presented to his gaze was at that hour of the afternoon indeed beautiful and claude who was heated from his long walk was fain to dwell longer upon it from his sheltered bower but even as he fed his eyes upon the wide sweep of landscape before him he remembered frank and thought of the disquiet that his absence must be causing his guardian he brought his legs on the same side of the branch and was about to descend when he observed two men within a short distance of him walking over the ground he had so lately traversed he paused to look at them and strange for claude was unfavorably impressed one of them was a man beyond middle age with a thick neck heavy lips and coarse features his face was covered with black bristles while the hair of his head was sprinkled with gray his companion was a thin nervous man young beardless with a pale haggard face and a scar slanting across the upper lip his face though not altogether lacking in refinement was repulsive the two were gesticulating and talking in tones of excitement here's where we're to meet him delaney said the elder man and it's a cool place too saying which he seated himself at the foot of the tree he should have been here by this time jordan confound him snarled delaney we want to loot the place before the priest gets back bosh growled the other in a hard metallic voice you've no nerve man the priest can't possibly get back before ten o'clock to-night i sent him on a sick call which will give him fifteen miles ride there alone you just keep cool young man do you know where everything is jordan yes i know the lay of the church pretty well in the room back of the altar the sacristy you mean oh bother the name there's two gold cups and one silver cup they're called chalices put in delaney i was an altar boy once then continued jordan there's a lot of lace stuff surplices you ignoramus well no matter they're costly the priest has rich relations in germany and they've been giving him lots of fine things those two gold cups came from germany and are worth taking what about the taborium asked delaney claude had not moved a muscle during this conference he listened quietly but with a face every feature of which had sharpened into eagerness of attention taborium repeated the other yes that's kept in the tabernacle talk english said jordan you're a fool cried delaney the cut upon his lip quivering and giving a most forbidding expression to his face didn't you see a light in the church 
Yes, it was burning before a sort of table. Before the altar, you mean. Well, right above the table, as you call it. Didn't you see a sort of little house with a little door and a keyhole in it? Yes. Well, that's the tabernacle. Inside that there's a sort of goblet covered with a veil of silk. The goblet, maybe, is of gold. If it's of silver, then the inside is gold-plated. Oh, exclaimed the other with fervor, I do hope it's of gold. Well, in that cup they keep a lot of little white pieces of bread called hosts. The Catholics say that it has only the form and appearance of bread, but that in reality it is God the Son. I don't care what they think, grumbled the other, but I hope the cup is of gold. But I do care, said Delaney, with his gashed upper lip curling so as to show his sharp white teeth. I'll get even with them for making me believe that those pieces of bread were God. I'll get even with that cursed Dutch priest who prevented me from marrying a girl because I stood up for Ingersoll. I'll take every host in that chiborium and I'll break each one in bits and I'll scatter them all about the church. Oh, what a fool I was the day I made my first communion. Claude turned pale as he caught these blasphemous words, and was within a little of losing his hold upon the branch. So that man below him had made his first communion? Jordan merely laughed. They say I was a pious boy, continued the other in low, scornful tones. They meant that I was a fool. I might be a fool yet if my father hadn't taken me from the Catholic school and sent me to finish at the high school and stopped the catechism business and made my mother let up on religion. I began to see how I had been fooled. I read Ingersoll. He's my man, and I've got along first rate without the help of the Christian God. The language was hideous, the face in keeping with the language. And so that man made his first communion once upon a time, thought Claude, his face pale with horror. Then he thought of Ray, the young, the beautiful, the innocent. Ah, here comes Monroe, cried Jordan, who paid no attention to Delaney's reminiscences. Is it all right, Monroe? he asked eagerly. Yes, answered Monroe, producing from his pocket a large key. Here's the key of the church. I sent the housekeeper a message from her sister, who lives six miles north of here, and she bit at once. As soon as she left, I got this key. What about the key of the tabernacle? asked Delaney eagerly. That's provided for. The priest, you know, carries the key of the tabernacle himself. Oh, we can smash the tabernacle, said Jordan. That won't be necessary, said Monroe. There's a key hanging on a nail behind the door in the sacristy. It opens the wardrobe, but it happens to fit the tabernacle, too. You see, I know things pretty well. What else did you live in the village for? asked Jordan. I'll take care of that tabernacle, said Delaney, and it would do me good to see how the people will look when they find they've been stamping on their hosts as they walk through the aisles. I didn't know I'd get this key of the church door, continued Monroe, and so first I thought we'd have to climb through the sacristy window. It's twelve feet high, but there is a lightning rod beside it, and the window isn't bolted. The key is a long sight better, said Jordan. Well, why don't you fellows come on, growled Delaney. One would think that you had a week to do it in. 
Yes, but before we start, the question is, how shall we go? Oh, on the road, of course, said Monroe. Won't we be seen? asked Delaney. There's next to no risk, because the people are mostly all, except the sick and an old granny or so, out on a picnic, and I know for sure that they won't start back till the moon is up. Yes, and it will be up pretty soon, cried Delaney nervously, for the sun is down already. Come on, Jordan rose. Now, remember, he said impressively, remember that we're not to do any running or show any signs of being in a great hurry, so that even if someone sees us, they won't think that we're up to any game. Step out now. Claude waited till they were gone some little distance, when he quickly climbed to the end of the branch on which he had been sitting, thus bringing himself on the inner side of the hedge. Then he swung himself to a lower branch, and from that dropped to the ground, a feat that few boys could have performed without injury to their limbs. Screened by the hedge, he broke into a light trot, picking each step as he went. The crackle of a twig, the rustle of a leaf, might attract the notice of the horrible trio preceding him on the road. As he drew nearer them, he became more wary. He stepped quickly, but he chose each foothold with an unerring eye. On he moved, light as a fairy, on till he was abreast the men, and held his breath, and wondered whether they could possibly hear the beating of his heart. Slowly, surely he advanced, slowly, lightly, deftly, till at length the men were many paces behind. Then Claude took a long breath, and broke into a run, where earnestness and energy and love and determination lent wings to the natural speed of his feet. On he dashed, perfect master of his breath, the rich color mounting into his cheeks, the breeze of the calm twilight sweeping his soft hair over his brow. On he dashed, till the hedgerow ceased, and a rail fence stood before him. Not stopping even to put his hand on the fence, Claude leaped high in the air and made on, nor did he even so much as turn his head to see whether the thieves were in sight or not. Luckily, a bend in the road shut him off from their sight. Very shortly the church was gained, and Claude, grasping the lightning-rod, went up hand over hand to a level with the window. It was the work of one moment to throw back the shutter and open the window, the work of another to leap into the room, snatch the key from the sacristy, and hurry into the sanctuary. It was rather dark in the church, so dark that for a moment Claude, coming out of the clearer light of the sacristy, could discern objects with difficulty. At the gospel side, upon the altar, rested the sanctuary lamp, its trembling flame shining through the red glass in honor of the blessed sacrament. Claude made a genuflection, ascended the altar steps, and fitting the key into the lock, threw open the door of the tabernacle. As he genuflected for the second time, he could distinctly hear the beatings of his heart. In the tabernacle there was a veiled object. Claude removed the veil, raised the cover, and holding the chiborium with trembling hands, looked down into its cup. There lay twelve consecrated hosts. Imagine a man who, after years of preparation and study, has been ordained, ascending the altar to say his first mass. His limbs tremble beneath him when for the first time he pronounces the sacred words of consecration, and knows that with the pronouncing of these words what had been bred before is now the body and blood, the soul and divinity of Christ. Very similar was the feeling of Claude as he gazed upon the sacred particles. Here he stood, face to face, with him, who, although ruler of earth and sky, had been born in a stable with him who had been despised insulted put to death he had conquered death but he could still be insulted and it was claude's office to save him and as claude fell upon his knees still holding in his hands the tiborium he turned from christ to himself 
at once in a long endless procession came his sins his faults his negligences his bursts of anger oh how terrible they looked sins against whom claude asked himself this question and looking into the chiborium saw the answer they were against him who through love for us through the desire of being ever with us to feed us with the bread of life had for nineteen centuries borne the insults and outrages of thousands and thousands of brutal ungrateful men and with this thought claude made an act of contrition for the sins of his life all these thoughts flashed through claude's mind with incredible rapidity these few moments crowded together thoughts that in ordinary circumstances should occupy hours again a fit of trembling came upon him there were steps approaching the awful moment was come for claude was determined that not one of the consecrated species should ever fall into the renegade's hands they might take his life that question he did not consider worth the dwelling upon but think of it he a small boy who had but the night before flown into a passion he was now to hold god in his fingers and receive him into his bosom then surging upon his soul came all his sins like waves of menace his scrupulosity had reached the snapping point and as he heard the footfalls of the thieves ascending the steps of the church the scrupulosity snapped bowing his head while tears born of many and varied emotions started to his eyes he murmured reverently lord i am not worthy and with the words he took the hosts in his trembling fingers and placed them in his mouth folding his hands in prayer and turning upon the kneeling bench so as to face the door he waited claude had made his first communion the key turned in the lock and three men entered the atheist delaney taking the lead what's that cried the atheist jumping back and falling against jordan no wonder he started in terror the church to those who had just entered out of the waning twilight was quite dark save within the radius of a few feet of the sanctuary lamp and there within its radius delaney's eyes fell upon a face fair beautiful sweet composed the calm eyes looking straight at him blue calm eyes and open shining with a sweetness a sorrow and a light such as would become an angel in human form standing guard at a desecrated shrine jordan caught delaney's hand monroe put his arms through jordan's and while delaney would have taken to flight the other two stood in stupid alarm there was a silence but claude happy claude those moments of silence were the sweetest of his life for in those fleeting seconds great waves of love flooded his soul and great waves of light illumined his mind he saw it now he saw what he had failed to see in his adventure with worden he saw the horror and ugliness of sin there it rose before him stamped upon the souls and faces of the men who stood in the twilight at the door those three men represented sin it was possible he perceived in that moment of insight to be a sinner without being a thief a profaner of the blessed sacrament a murderer but in the long run sin was sin and every sinner no matter whether he were rough or gentle high or low rich or poor every sinner in the world cast his lot in with these men there might be a difference but the difference was of degree not of kind facing him there was sin but ah what a gulf between them next to sin near to sin by the length of a church was love 
incarnate love there was to be a choice between these two sin with its foulness christ with his love no reasoning creature of god's could escape the choice and now the choice was given to claude in answer his soul soared high in a blaze of love the light the true light was within his bosom he saw the light he heard the voice and aided by the powerful graces that were finding full play of activity in his soul he made an act of perfect love and love drove out fear claude's scruples were gone for ever and so there was sin in the world claude had never before appreciated this sad fact but now in the light that poured upon him he saw the mystery of life and upon his spirit settled a sense of the sacredness of his own being it was given to him to use for love consists not in words but in deeds all these things flashed through claude's mind while the three men stood pausing at the door it's a human being whispered jordan i saw tears on its face it can't be a ghost i thought it was an angel said delaney hm i thought you didn't believe in god who's that called jordan in a loud voice claude continued to pray in silence are you a boy cried monroe no answer well said jordan suppose we move up together the three stepped slowly up the middle aisle as they advanced claude rose to his feet why it's nothing but a boy cried delaney i see his clothes now we must catch him before we do anything else boy come here claude neither spoke nor moved he was watching his chance to escape to bring away his life which belonged to god with an oath delaney rushed at claude just as he was about to put his hands upon him claude who had stepped upon a kneeling bench leaped over the altar railing into the side aisle and sprang for the door the three men were after him at once and as he flew down the steps a bullet whistled by his ear then claude heard frank's welcome voice he answered at once but it was not the same claude whom frank had known that made answer for in the few minutes that had passed before the tabernacle claude had undergone a wondrous change and the problem had been solved end of chapter twenty three